Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Davis, President and CEO of the Mount Sinai Health System. And it's my honor and pleasure to be with Scott Gottlieb, who is a fellow of the American Enterprise Institute, a member of the board of Pfizer and Illumina, a, also a board member of Mount Sinai, um, a graduate of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and a past commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. We're going to be talking about COVID and the pandemic. It's been a year since this emergency began, um, and still we have a lot of unanswered questions that I hope we're going to be able to address today. So Scott, let's talk about what's on everybody's mind, and that is, is this the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end? Where are we? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, probably the middle. I think we're. This is a year when we're going to transition from the pandemic phase of this virus to um, a more seasonal type of pattern with the virus. And what we're likely to see over the next months, as we get into the spring and the summer, I think, is continued declines in cases. Um, but the new wrinkle is the variants, whether or not they're going to create more prevalence or an upsurge in cases. I don't think we're going to see a fourth wave of infection uh, like they're seeing in Europe right now. I think we're further ahead of Europe because of the vaccination that we've done. The one variable that worries me is the 1526 mutation that's actually circulating in New York, where you've seen a backup in cases in New York City. And about half of those infections, those 1526 mutations have the same variant, same mutation that's in the South African variant, that 484K mutation that seems to um, allow people to get reinfected and maybe reduce the effectiveness of the vaccines. That, that, that variant, I think, is particularly concerning. Yeah. Um, so let's talk for a second about why all these variants appear. Um, as I understand it, the more it's transmitted, the more is there a chance for mutation. And although we're vaccinating a good part of the United States and probably Canada and eventually Europe, um, the ability to vaccinate in Asia and Africa is still in an infantile stage, in its infancy. So the question is, will we just keep mutating and we're just going to be a dog chasing its own tail because this is so transmissible and we're gonna be talking about this for years to come. Yeah, hopefully not. I mean, the mutations that are arising um, seem to be arising almost spontaneously in people who are developing chronic infection. So people who are immunocompromised develop the infection, can't clear it. The infection continues to replicate inside an individual and then it mutates inside that host. And we're seeing what we call convergent evolution, where these mutations are actually popping up simultaneously in different parts of the world. So it's not a not just a function of the mutation arising in one part of the world and then spreading or the virus commingling and swapping genes. These mutations are sort of arising spontaneously. The conventional wisdom right now, if you talk to the people at Scripps or Trevor Bedford at the Hutch and others, people at Sinai working on this um, too, is that this is mutating at about the same rate of influenza A right now. That's a fast rate of mutation. A lot of people think that it's mutated very quickly because there's so much infection around the world, but it's reached a new fitness level that it's sort of mutated rapidly over a short period of time and it's not gonna continue to mutate at this rate. And it's already done a lot of the things it's likely to do. So if there's sort of 30 tricks in the bag of this virus, it's done 15 to 20 of them. So we've seen a lot of what it's able to do. And now what the drug companies are trying to do, including Pfizer, the company I'm on the board of, is develop new, new variant vaccines that bake in a lot of the diversity that the virus has already shown us. So a new, an ideal new variant vaccine wouldn't be against the South African variant or the Brazilian variant or B117. It would try to bake in as much of the biological diversity that the virus has already shown us as possible. And maybe some of the things the virus hasn't done yet, but that we think are possible. We hoped initially that this wouldn't be a situation like the flu, where every year we need another vaccine because it's mutated, and that the flu vaccine from year to year is 50 or 60 or 70 percent effective, not 95 percent effective. But it seems that what you're telling us now is, yeah, it'll mutate, and it's going to be like the flu, and we're going to need booster shots. So does this, is there a possibility to be pessimistic for a second, that um, we're going to need a booster shot almost every year. I think I think the view is that it's going to mutate, but then it's going to slow down. Um, so you know, it's mutated a lot. 
we, we, we are going to be looking at new variant vaccines this year, but it's not likely to continue to mutate at this rate like the flu, where every year it, it, we need a new vaccine or it mutates within a span of one season. So in the 2017-2018 flu season, as you remember, the vaccine was only 25% effective that season. We guessed wrong. The virus mutated more than we anticipated. I think what's likely to happen is that we're going to you know, have these new variant vaccines for a period of time. And in the pace of adaptation will slow down. We might still need a booster every year. I think it's possible we're going to need a booster every year, but that's because we're going to want to take maximal protection into the winter and there is going to be some drift, but you're not going to see these dramatic changes where we could all of a sudden lose the vaccines. And I mean, even this year, even with these variants circulating based on the experimental evidence we have so far, the current vaccines are still going to be effective against these new variants. You know, the question is, do we try to optimize the vaccines, particularly for people who are more vulnerable to this infection? I think we're going to try to do that. But we're unlikely to lose the vaccine in the same way we could sort of lose a flu vaccine within a span of one season. OK, so this is different than the flu and the mutations are not going to be, you think, every year. Yeah, the, you um, know, the, this virus probably sits. So measles doesn't mutate, can't accept mutations that change its surface proteins. Flu changes its surface proteins all the time. It has changes in its, its genetic sequence. It's a, it's a segmented RNA virus. This probably sits somewhere in the middle. It's going to be able to mutate in ways that it can accept changes in its surface proteins, but not at the same rate it flew, as flu. But it's not going to be um, like measles, where it doesn't change at all. So we're going to have to evolve our vaccines over time, but probably not at the pace that we're currently seeing it evolve right now. So we're going to need some booster vaccines. As head of the FDA, tell us from the time that we know we need them until the time that we know we're going to get them and they'll be safe and we can start inoculating again, how long does it take? Probably right now, six months. I mean, we, the paradigm for flu is that we could license new flu vaccines as long as they're in um, current manufacturing processes. So as long as you're using the cell-based manufacturing processes that have been authorized or the egg-based manufacturing processes, all of the development work actually takes place by testing the new vaccines against serum, not actually not testing them in people. You're not even looking at antibody production in human volunteers. In this case, the FDA is likely to authorize new variant vaccines using the existing platforms by allowing companies to test them in a small number of people, maybe 500 people, and, and demonstrating that the vaccines will induce antibody levels that are equal to what we see antibody levels in people who've been infected and have recovered. And so but that's sort of a proxy for effectiveness. And even though the antibody levels aren't the only measure of the effectiveness of the vaccine, we know the vaccines are probably inducing other kinds of immune cells that we're not measuring. FDA feels that the antibody levels are good enough as a proxy for now to allow those to be the surrogate for the basis of authorizing new variant vaccines. So that, that process that I've described that's probably a six month process, that kind of clinical testing. It's already underway. So we could have these vaccines in time for the fall. We've been told by Moderna and Pfizer that even though we have mutations, the vaccine is still very effective against severe disease and death. But they don't make any claims about modest disease or even asymptomatic disease. But we know that a lot of the chronic patients and there is a substantial number of people who have chronic conditions after this, um, that they will still perhaps not be protected. So do you think we get to a point ever where there's a vaccine that's going to be efficacious enough that we're not gonna wind up with a lot of these chronic long haulers, we're gonna get moderate disease, but still gonna have a very long problem? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question how much this vaccine is preventing asymptomatic infection and transmission. The data coming out of Israel is reassuring that it's it's definitely impacting asymptomatic infection and transmission. I think most people accept that it's reducing asymptomatic transmission. Um, the question is the magnitude. I think the balance of the evidence that we're seeing is it could be substantial. I mean, it could be a big impact on, on not just reducing severe disease, measurable disease, but also reducing asymptomatic infection. And if you can do that, presumably you can prevent people from ever developing the infection in a way that they might not get very sick in the beginning, to your point, but they go on to develop these sort of long-term chronic conditions uh, as a result of, of COVID. So, you know, that remains to be seen how much um, we're gonna be able to reduce asymptomatic infection with the current crop of vaccines. I think within the next month or two, we'll have a much better answer to that question. 
and it will be based on the real world evidence. This isn't a question that's easy to answer with pre-market evidence in a clinical trial. Actually, some of the best studies looking at this are actually um, the studies in primates where you infect primates and then see whether or not they can transmit. But the real world evidence, I think, is going to trump that. And a lot of that data is going to probably come out of Israel. All right. So one last question. What have we learned from this? And how do we prepare better for the next pandemic that won't be COVID, but could be something else? Yeah, I mean, a lot of things. I think we, we learned that we lack the resiliency in our systems that we thought we had, the ability to scale testing, the ability to scale manufacturing. The science was there to quickly pivot towards the development of therapeutics, but then the ability to scale the manufacturing um, wasn't in place. The ability to deploy a diagnostic test at scale and get people tested. I think we had prepared, all of our pandemic preparedness had been oriented around a flu model. And we didn't recognize early enough that um, this virus didn't behave like flu and flu might not behave like flu. I think we need to have a much more flexible doctrine. The other big thing I would say is that we need to treat um, public health preparedness as a matter of national security. And that also includes figuring out ways to get better reporting um, in a near real time fashion. We were very dependent, we still are on multilateral agreements and conventions for sharing between nations and public health authorities. That's still very important. We're still gonna to have to do that. But if anything, COVID conditioned behavior for countries are probably gonna be less willing to share information. The minute the UK said they had a new variant, what, what did the French do? They shut the channel. So I think people are gonna be more reluctant to share information. And we're gonna to have to figure out ways to get our intelligence services engaged in this mission. That's always been a line we didn't wanna cross. I think there's an inevitability that we're gonna to have to look, look towards those kinds of capabilities. All right. Well, thank you very much, Scott. This was really enlightening. Thanks a lot.